going to read the whole letter. It's a little long, but I, I, l- I like to just read the passage and get its lodged in our mind before we go back and unpack it. Follow with me, beginning in verse 14. Unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write these things, saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works or deeds, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou art cold or hot, so that because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich, and white remnant that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness does not appear. Anoint your eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous. Word means boiling hot or on fire. And repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcomes will I grant to sit with me in my throne even as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. We come in our series to the uh, last church of the seven churches of the apocalypse. It is the church of Laodicea. I would describe it as the apostate, lukewarm church of the last days. It's interesting that it follows the church of Philadelphia, the church which Christ had no reproof, only praise for. And the letter to Laodiceans has no praise, only reproof. The church of Laodicea was a church that was apostate. It was a church that was outside of Christ, and he has no praise for it. The church of Philadelphia had an open door of opportunity, and they were stepping through it by faith and evangelism. The church at Laodicea had shut the door to Christ, and he was outside knocking, seeking entrance. The Laodicean church is the last day lukewarm church. Look at verse 16. He says, so then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, literally Jesus said, I will vomit you out of my mouth. This is a really, really stern letter to a sad church, so-called in Laodicea. I found that of all the letters to the seven churches, this is the one most difficult for me to digest and comprehend that this church was so nauseating to Christ that he had nothing good to say, and he said, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Now, again, as we looked at these seven churches, I want to remind you they were actual churches, seven of them, in the area of Asia Minor, western Turkey. And he's writing to these churches on issues that are going on in the church. Seven churches, seven issues, each letter to the church. But they also give us seven periods or epochs in church history. Now, some would question that interpretation, but I think that there's characteristics that you can see as you go through. You can study church history from the birth of the church in Acts 2 to next Sunday, I believe, in chapter 4, verse 1, the rapture of the church, where the church is caught up victoriously in heaven. But there's a third way to view these seven churches, and that is important that each one of the church has characteristics, good or bad, that are applicable to all churches today. So as you go through all seven churches, you can say there's a little of this and a little of that, good things here, bad things here, that all apply to all churches. And the characteristics also apply to us individually as believers. So its first and primary interpretation is to the churches there at that time But secondly, it applies to us today, individually and corporately, as the church as well. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, Paul says to his young protege, Timothy, in the latter times, some, not all, but some shall depart from the faith. He goes on to say, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons and having their conscience seared with a hot iron. 
The Bible is very clear that in the last days, which I believe the Laodicean church depicts, that it will be a time of apostasy. That's that word departure. An apostate is someone who professes to believe in Jesus Christ, but doesn't possess eternal life. And at one point in time, they turn around and they abandon or forsake the faith in Christ that they once professed. Peter describes them in his second epistle. He said, it's like a dog going back to its vomit. It's like a pig that goes back after being washed to wallowing in the mire. They were never really regenerated and they abandoned the faith that they professed. Now only God knows the heart. And it's hard to tell the real from the false. In Matthew 13, we have what's called the kingdom parables. And in the kingdom parables, there's always the mixture of the true and the false. There's the wheat and the tares. There'll always be wheat and tares in the church. The wheat represent true believers. The tares represent false believers. They look like Christians, talk like Christians, act like Christians, profess to be Christians, but they are tares and they will be separated when the Lord returns. So we want to look at this church at Laodicea, which is a church, I believe, all of tares. That it's a church that represents an unregenerated, professing church but there's no reality. There's nothing of commendation to this church. It's only rebuke and counsel. So we want to look and listen to what Christ says to this church at Laodicea. There are four sections I want to point out in this text. The first in verse 14, we have Christ describes himself. He gives his description in verse 14. Unto the angel of the church and Laodiceans write these things, saith, here's the description, the amen, the faithful and true witness, and thirdly, the beginning of the creation of God. Now in all these letters we had in the first verse, which is like the salutation of the letter, we have the church, we have the city, and we have the Christ. We know very little about the church in Laodicea. It was near Colossae. And when Paul wrote to the Colossians in chapter 2, verse 1, he said, Say hi to those who are in Laodicea, who have not seen my face in the flesh. So he'd never been to Laodicea, but no doubt his ministry in Ephesus, and as he wrote to the Colossians, that he expanded out to them that he knew some of them, but they not really, uh, he had not been there to found the church or to start the church. And you have that reference in Colossians 2.1. But the city of Laodicea was a wealthy inland city about 40 miles east of Ephesus. It was steeped in Greek culture and learning, and it was thriving center of commerce. We've looked every week at the map. You have the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia. And the farthest to the east and south, 40 miles east of Ephesus, sending the farthest inland is the city of Laodicea, lie in what's called the Lycius Valley, and next to it were the city of Heropolis and Colossae in this valley, and we have the letter to the Colossians. But it was a thriving commerce and place of industry. It was a thoroughfare from east to west and from north to south. But the focus in verse 14, look at it with me, is not the, the church or the city, it's the Christ and I believe that this description is apropos for the need in the church in Laodicea. He's described in three ways. The Amen. Notice it in verse 14. For thus saith the Amen. Stop right there. Now, that kind of freaks us out. We think, what in the world does he mean I'm the Amen? We usually put Amen at the end of our prayers. We say in Jesus' name, Amen. But the word amen is actually Hebrew, and it's a transliteration from the Hebrew, and it literally means true, means true. So when you say amen, that's, you're saying that's true, or I agree with that. But in the Hebrew mind, it meant it was true. And there's a couple references in the Old Testament to God being the God of amen. One of them is in Isaiah 65, verse 16, where it says the God of truth 
or amen. The word truth in the Hebrew is actually the word amen. I remember when Jesus would teach many times, he would introduce what he was going to say with the words, verily, verily. Remember that? That is amen, amen, or truly, truly is what he's saying. So the word amen means that I'm the true and living God. I'm the God of amen. Jesus is the final authority and revelation of God. He's the divine affirmation whose promises are true and certain to be fulfilled. And we're not used to this concept of Jesus being the amen, but it means he's the affirmation, the confirmation, the truth of all that God says in his word, and that everything he says is true. And again, it's apropos to the church at Laodicea. And then secondly, he's described as the faithful and true witness. So he's the amen affirmation of God, and he's the faithful and true witness of God. This is in contrast to the false witnesses of the prophets. He sees, he knows all things. He can testify faithfully and truthfully about God the Father. One of the doctrines that I so love in the Bible is the doctrine of revelation. And one of the chief ways God reveals himself is in his son, Jesus Christ. God cannot be known apart from revelation. So God has to reveal himself. So he's done that by sending his son, Jesus. He reveals himself in his word, reveals himself in creation, reveals himself in conscience. He, he reveals himself through prophets, sometimes dreams, angels, all, all those ways through the scriptures. But the primary and chief means by which God reveals himself was to come down to earth in the person of his son through the womb of the Virgin Mary, becoming the God-man who revealed to us the nature of God. Remember when Jesus said in John 14, I'm going to the Father's house? And a little later, Philip in the discussion says, Lord, if you'd show us the Father, we'd be satisfied. That'd be really cool if we could just see the Father. And I love the Lord's response. He said, Philip, have I been with you for so long and you've never seen me? It's kind of like Philip, duh. He that has seen me has seen the Father. Now, don't misinterpret that statement. Jesus is not the Father. He reveals the Father. So by seeing Jesus, you see the Father in his nature and character. He is the revelation of God the Father. He's not the Father, but he came to reveal God the Father because he's God the Father. Son. So he is the faithful witness. And then thirdly, in verse 14, this is so important, he describes himself as the beginning of the creation of God. Now again, we need to make sure we don't misunderstand that statement. The beginning there means chief or source. It has nothing to do with chronology. It has everything to do with priority. It's not saying that he's the first one or thing created. That's an ancient heresy known as Arianism, which was picked up by the Jehovah's Witnesses today that taught that Jesus Christ was created by God the Father as Michael the archangel. And somehow, I don't know how he morphed from Michael the, my Michael the archangel to Jesus the Son of God, which really isn't anywhere in the Scriptures nor taught. In John 1.1 1, 1 it says, in the beginning was the what? The Word. He's eternal. And the Word was with God. He's face to face with the Father. He's personal. And the Word was God. He's divine. So He's the eternal Word, the personal Word, the divine Word. And then verse 14 of John 1, He's the incarnate Word. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. But to get back to our statement, the beginning of the creation of God, I love what Charles Erdman said. He said, not a part of creation, but the uncreated principle of creation from whom it took its origins. I would rephrase that by saying he's the uncreated creator of all things. He's the uncreated creator of all things. You ever have your kids ask you who made God? And you go, I don't know. Don't ask those questions. No one made God. And that's the simple answer. It's the true answer. No one made God. God made all things. 
Everything came from God. He is eternal. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Our triune God is eternal. But Jesus is the uncreated creator of all things. Write down Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. For by Him, that is Christ, all things were created. He created everything. Now, for this church... This was so important to understand that Jesus Christ is God. He is the amen, the final authority, and he is the final witness of all things. It's interesting if you reverse the order of this description, you have number one, he's the beginning of creation or the source of all things. He's the faithful and true witness of everything that emanates from God. And then thirdly, he is the I am, or he's, excuse me, the amen, the ultimate and final authority. So I thought that was kind of cool as you reverse that order. All things come from him. He reveals all things of the Father, and he is the final and ultimate authority of God. Now, why did I say that this description of Christ is important for the church at Laodicea? Because it's very, very possible that the church at Laodicea, being near Colossae, had begun to be invaded by false teachers denying the deity and the authority of Jesus Christ. When Paul wrote the epistle to the Colossians, you know what his theme was? Christ. That he is to have preeminence, not prominence, preeminence. A lot of people will give Christ an important place, but not the ultimate important place, the top place. And Colossians sets forth the deity of Christ. It's a marvelous Christological epistle. If you want to know Christ, read Colossians. And so it's possible that they had a false doctrine which led to their apostasy, which was apostasy, denying the deity of Jesus Christ. And and it's important because if you're wrong about Christ, you're wrong about God. If you're wrong about Jesus, you're wrong about Christianity. Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. No one gets to the Father but by Him. You better be right about Jesus Christ. You better not have a false doctrine when it comes to Christ. Nothing more important than your Christology, your doctrine of who Jesus Christ is. So it could be that He described Himself this way because the Colossian heresy began to infiltrate the church there in Laodicea. But you know what? It's the same thing we need today. How my heart aches for the church today, universal, to know the biblical Christ. How my heart yearns to see a doctrinally sound, biblical-focused church. Not only our church, but all churches. Went to God that every church that congregate was preaching expositionally the Bible and teaching sound doctrine. Do I get an amen? Amen. It's so important. If we're wrong about Christ, we're wrong about God. And so Christ in verses 15 to 17, the second section, condemns the church at Laodicea. He said, I know your works or your deeds, that thou art neither cold nor hot. The word know is their oida. I know intuitively. I'm omniscient, I understand. And I know your works that you're neither cold nor hot. I would thou art cold or hot. And because you are lukewarm, there it is, and neither cold nor hot, I will spit you or spew you or vomit you out of my mouth. Because, he says, and then he says, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, I have need of nothing. And you know not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Now it's pretty bad when the Lord says, you're wretched, you're miserable, you're poor, you're blind, and you're naked. That comes from the lips of Jesus Christ. Now when they looked at themselves in the mirror, they said, we're rich. We're increased with goods. We have need of nothing. And Jesus said, no, you're miserable, man. You're wretched, you're naked, you're poor, and you're blind. Now, It's interesting, the city of Laodicea had a water problem. They had to ship in their water from two sources, Heropolis and Colossae. 
And the water that came from Heropolis was a hot spring, but it came through a conduit. And by the time it got to Colossae, it was lukewarm. And the water that came from Colossae, or time it got to Laodicea, by the time it came from Colossae to Laodicea, it was not cold. The water that came from Colossae was cold water. So the Heropolis provided hot water, Colossae provided cold water, but by the time it got to Laodicea, I think I got it straight that time. It was lukewarm, nauseating, lukewarm water, and that's why Jesus said, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Now, what does he mean by lukewarm? This is the challenge of this passage. I believe they were most likely professing Christians, but not genuine, true, authentic, possessing Christians. Now, I do believe that it's possible for you to be saved and to slip into carnality and apathy and complacency. Many people have applied this to carnal Christians or apathetic Christians. And by all means, if you're a Christian that's apathetic and complacent, wake up, repent, get right with God, be on fire. But I believe the context here, the church at Laodicea, this apostate church of the last days, is actually a reference to professing Christians in name only. Simply stated, they weren't really saved. They weren't really Christians. You know, you ever driven by a church and it says, First Church of Christ or whatever? But that doesn't mean that it's filled with people who are Christian. That doesn't mean they're saved. Remember, there's wheat and tares growing together. There's the leaven stuck in the meal. It grows together. So there's the doctrine in the last days that the church will turn away from the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. And that's happening in the time that we live. And I believe that we live right now in this Laodicean era. I believe that we live this day in this Laodicean air of apostasy and lukewarmness. I don't believe they're saved. They had no zeal for God, nor absolute repudiation of the Lord. In other words, they're not on fire for the Lord, and they're not against the Lord. They're just neutral or lukewarm. Some would describe them as evangelical, but not evangelistic. I like that. Oh, we're evangelical church, but they don't reach out to the lost. How do you win the lost when you're lost? How do you evangelize people when you need to be evangelized? So they're like tipid water that actually works as an amenic. is caused as vomiting. They would actually use lukewarm water to cause someone to vomit intentionally. It was a medical term for this water that they drank that would cause them to vomit. So I know it's kind of radical, but Jesus is actually saying, you make me sick. You make me want to vomit is what he's saying here. So this is why it's so hard to to, to digest what he's saying to this church. And to think that this could be the tenor of the church today, now it doesn't mean there's not wheat, there's not genuine believers, but many of the mainline denominations of our nation today in the last 50, 60 years have abandoned the doctrine of Christ the inerrancy, infallibility, and inspiration of Scripture. They've adopted a cultural Christianity. They're apostate in every sense of the word. And God says, I'm nauseated by you. I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Jesus actually said these words. They're so powerful. And the answer is, why is he nauseated? Why will he spit them out? Because they didn't take Jesus or his word seriously. And you know that these are the hardest kind of people to reach. Notice in verse 15, he says, I wish that you were cold or hot. He says, you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either cold or hot. Therefore, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth because you're lukewarm. You know, the hardest people to reach for the gospel are people that think they're saved and they're not. You ever talk to somebody about Christ? And You know, have you been born again? I'm a Christian. I believe in God. I go to church. I've been baptized. I take communion. And you know that they're really not born again from the way they respond or the understanding of what a Christian is, but they're so hard to reach. Jesus said, you're not going to go to the doctor unless you know you're sick. If you don't know you're sick, you're not going to go to the doctor. 
And Jesus dealt with this so often in the scriptures, but this leads me in verse 17 to the second thing he condemned them about. Not only were they lukewarm, but they were self-deceived. The worst deception is self-deception. Look at verse 17. He's actually giving us the reason why he will spew them out of their mouth and they're lukewarm. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increase with goods. I have need of nothing. That was their view of themselves. But he says to them, what you don't know is that you are wretched, you're miserable, you're poor, you're blind, and you're naked. Another way to say it is you are sinners. You're lost. You think you're okay. You think you're fine. So they misdiagnosed themselves. Reminds me of Hans Christian Andersen's story of the emperor's new clothes. And the king's walking, the emperor's walking down the street in his underwear, and everybody's like, yes, you're awesome. Wow, that's awesome. You know? And the little kid goes, he's naked. And then he realized that he had no clothes. How many people today think that they're all clothed in the righteousness of Christ, but they're clothed only in their self-righteousness, which the Bible says are filthy rags in the sight of a holy God? How important it is to have God's estimation of ourself. Charles Erdman said, he said, tepid religion is nauseating. One who has made no profession of faith and is conscious of his or her lack of moral life and spiritual condition is in far more helpful condition than one who thinks himself to be a Christian and yet has no real spiritual life and is oblivious to his desperate need. Remember when Jesus gave the parable of the Pharisee and the publican? The Pharisee was the most religious sect of the Jews. Had the broad robes, had the phylacteries, had the prayer shawls, had everything going for him. And then the publican. Now the publican was synonymous with sinners. They were tax collectors. And they both went down to the temple to pray. And the Pharisee stood with himself and prayed thus, God, I thank you. I am not like other men. And then a little sanctified imagination, he probably pointed to the publican. It's like, like this sinna. Probably said like sinna over there. I give tithes of all I possess. And you can hear people clapping for him. Wow, you're awesome. Can I touch you? You're amazing. I fast twice a week. You can come watch me on Monday and Tuesday. I'm awesome. And he went on to brag. It was a prayer. It was a brag session about how awesome he was. And then Jesus said, this other man, this poor publican, this sinner, he came in and he just looked down. He didn't even want to look up. He was so humble and so broken. The Bible says a broken spirit and contrite heart God will not despise. And he just started to beat on his chest and he just said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus says, which one of those two went home that day justified? And everyone immediately knew the answer. Jesus said in his Beatitudes, blessed are the what? Poor in spirit. Blessed are they who mourn. Blessed are the meek. You see, that's what it means to come to him. It means that we come to him, and we're going to see in a minute his counsel as we buy of him. So the self-righteous Pharisee didn't see his need but the publican saw his need and he went home justified. The great Bible teacher G. Campbell Morgan said, he said, lukewarmness is the worst form of all blasphemy. How powerful is that? Lukewarmness is the worst form of all blasphemy. So they were uh, uh, apathetic, they were complacent, and they were self-deceived. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 9, verse 12, they that are whole need not a physician, but they which are sick. And they were sick. They were wretched, poor, blind, and naked in their unconverted state. So what does Christ do thirdly? Verse 18 to 20, he gives them some counsel. Now I would have abandoned them and just spit them out of my mouth and said, I'm done with you. 
But oh, the love of God, amen? Oh, the mercy of God and the patience of God. From verse 18 down to verse 20 is what we see, the love, the patience, the kindness and mercy of God to give them this counsel. I counsel you to buy of me, verse 18, gold tried in the fire that you may be rich, white remnant that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness do not appear. I want you to come to me and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, this is what motivated Christ's words, I rebuke and I chasten. Be zealous, the word means be boiling hot on fire, and repent. And behold, I stand at the door and I knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Now there are three things he counsels them to do in this section. First of all, he says, verse 18, buy of me. I counsel thee to buy of me. Now right away, we ask the question, how are you going to buy from him? He just told us we're poor. You said I'm wretched, miserable, naked, and blind. Now you want me to buy something from you? How do I buy anything from you? And the answer is by faith. Isaiah 55.1 actually has the answer. Ho, everyone who is thirsty, come to the water and drink. And then it says, he who has no money, come by and drink. I love that. That's, that's often where I say, there am I in the Bible, he who has no money. That's my verse. But I can have riches from God freely by faith. Amen? I may not have what the world has to offer, but I have what the Lord has to offer because I can come to Him by faith. How do we buy of Him? And what do we buy from Him? Well, we buy gold. Notice in verse 18, He tells us what to come buy. Gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich. You know that the city of Laodicea had several banks that kept gold there. They were known as a very wealthy city. And then he says also that you buy white remnant that you may be clothed. So we get the gold, which is true genuine faith. 1 Peter 1.7 says, tried in the fire. Then we get the white remnant that we may be clothed of our nakedness. That's the righteousness of Christ. The city of Laodicea was known for its wool, it actually specialized in a black wool. It was said to be very silky and beautiful, and people would come there to buy that wool. So he says, you buy me garments that are white. And there's an interesting Greek word translated white there. It doesn't mean white just in color. It means bright, like a light bulb or a sunlight. So beautiful radiating white, which is the righteousness of Christ. And then thirdly, anoint your eye with eye salve in order that you may see. So get gold from God to be rich in spiritual things. Get a white remnant from Him so you can be clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And get your eyes anointed with eye salve that you may see. And how interesting that the city of Laodicea was famous for eye salve. That they actually invented this ointment you put on your eyes to soothe your eyes to bring healing to your irritated eyes. What does that represent? I believe it represents the illumination of the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, Paul says, The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness for him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual discerns or understands all things. So our eyes are open. So all of this is spiritual. Spiritual gold, riches of God. Garments that are imputed to you by faith, the righteousness of Christ. Your eyes anointed with the Holy Spirit. Remember when you got saved and all of a sudden you had new eyes? The Bible's like, wow, where's this book been? I never saw that before. The Holy Spirit not only regenerates us, but illuminates us. When you read your Bible, you should pray and say, God, give me eyes to see. Open up my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy word. So Jesus is saying to them, this is what you need to buy. But here's the second counsel. It's in verse 19. We're not done yet. He says, be zealous and repent. Notice at verse 19, as many as I love, that was what motivated him. This is a phileo love for this unregenerated church. I 
love you, so I rebuke you and chasten you. So be zealous, therefore, and repent. Turn back to God. And then here's the third counsel in verse 20. It's one of the most popular verses and well-known verses in the entire Bible. And that is, open the door. So first, buy from me. Secondly, be zealous and repent. And thirdly, open the door. Verse 20, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If any man, and that word any man means any man, hear my voice, open the door. I will, it's a promise, come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Now, I've always loved this verse because Jesus, and I, I'm, I want to, before I joke, I'm going to tell you I'm joking so you'll know I'm joking. Jesus invites himself over for dinner. It's biblical. Try it out. Stand in the foyer and get somebody and say, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you open the door, I'll come in and eat your food. <laughs> Jesus did it. He went to Zacchaeus when Zacchaeus was up in the tree. Remember what he did? Come down, I'm going to your house for lunch. He invited himself. I think it's cool. Anyway. What does Jesus mean, behold, I stand at the door and I knock? Well, this is one of the challenging verses of this letter. But I believe that he's knocking at the door of the church primarily in its first interpretation, and in primary interpretation, that he wants back in the church of Laodicea. They kicked him out. Church has his name on it. It's the first church of Christ. It's called the Christian church. It's called the Bible church, but they don't read the Bible. Can you imagine that? Jesus is outside the church trying to get in. He's the head of the church. He's the Lord of the church. How sad to think that some churches out throughout history, and even today, have moved Christ outside of the church. He's not central anymore. When you come to this church, you should hear about Jesus. You should worship Jesus. Jesus Christ should be preached and glorified in all things. The biblical Christ, because He's the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by Him. So what He's knocking on is the door of the church. He wants back in this apostate, lukewarm, unsaved, Laocedian church. But I think it also has a secondary application, and even in the text would allude to this, that he's talking to individuals. Notice he says, any man or woman. So this is individual invitation. He says, hear my voice. That's the work of the Holy Spirit convicting the human heart. And open the door. So I believe that it suitingly can apply to the human heart. You might say, well, hearts don't have doors. Metaphorically speaking, he's saying you open your heart, you open the door of your heart, and I will come in. And the promise is there. If you open the door, that's you opening the door by your own volition. I will come in, and I will have supper with him and he with me. Now, in the Oriental mind, to eat with someone was to become one with someone. This is why Jews would never eat with Gentiles because you didn't want to become one with the Gentile. So Jesus said, if you open the door of your heart, I'll come into your life. The heart being the whole inner person. If you open your life and let me come in and take control, I'll have supper with you. I'll become one with you. I'll have fellowship with you. What a glorious picture that is of salvation. By the way, when he says you're miserable, wretched, naked, and blind, that's a description of being lost. Now he says, I'm knocking. If you open that door, I'll come in. And how does he get back in the church? Through the hearts and lives of people who repent and turn to him and open the door of their lives. How, do, how does Jesus knock? Through his word. John 5, verse 24. I tell you the truth. He who believes my word has everlasting life. Through his spirit. Secondly, John 16, 8. The spirit comes to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Through God's people, sharing God's Word and the power of God's Spirit, and through providence. Maybe the loss of a job, maybe the loss of your health, the loss of your wealth, maybe some other situation God has allowed in your life to wake you up, 
to get your attention. He's knocking on the door of your heart. He wants to come in. I don't know what you're going through right now, but it may be the voice of God knocking on the door of your heart. You go, I'm in church every Sunday. That doesn't make you a Christian. You have a door to your heart that needs to be opened. And until you open that door, Jesus Christ for every one of us right now is either outside knocking or inside having communion with you. Where is he? Is Jesus on the outside knocking? Open the door and let him come in. If Jesus is already in your heart, then by all means be boiling hot, be on fire for him. Now it closes in verse 21 and 22 with a comfort or promise to the overcomers. To him that overcometh. The reference to true believers. I will grant to sit with me on my throne. Think about that. Jesus is promising to true believers that one day we will sit with him on his throne, even as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. When will that happen? That will happen when we get raptured into heaven, experience the marriage supper of the Lamb, and then return in the second coming of Christ, and he sits upon the throne of David. God promised David in the Old Testament, your seed will sit on the throne forever and ever. You're going to have Messiah. It's called the Davidic covenant or promise. That's fulfilled in Jesus Christ when he comes back in the second coming and he sets up his kingdom for 1,000 years and we will co-reign with Christ. So he's promising us that we'll reign with him in the divinic kingdom for 1,000 years. And then he closes verse 22. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart by the Holy Spirit, but you must open the door. There's a famous painting done by an artist named Holman Hunt. And many years ago, he painted this beautiful picture, it's become a classic, of a garden, beautiful garden scene. At the end of the garden, there's a door where Jesus there is knocking on the door. Well, after Holman Hunt finished that painting, he invited some of his artist friends to come and critique it. And one was looking at the painting. He said, but Holman, you forgot something. He said, well, what, what, what have I forgotten? He says, you forgot the doorknob. <laughs> and if you've ever seen the painting, you know there's no doorknob on the outside. Well, Holman Hunt said, no, 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 no. This is intentional. The doorknob's on the inside. There's no knob on the outside. Jesus didn't say, behold, I stand and knock. If you don't open it, I'm busting it down. I'm coming in. We used to sing a song. I'm full of these old hymns that I heard as a boy growing up. There's a Savior who stands at the door of your heart. He's longing to enter. Why let him depart? He has patiently waited so often before, but you must open the door. Let's pray. If God has spoken to you through this message today and you're not sure that you're a child of God, maybe you don't know for sure that if you died today that you would go to heaven, you've never really trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I would like to lead you in a prayer right now, inviting Christ to come into your heart and to be your Savior. So as I pray this prayer, I want you to repeat it out loud right where you are after me. Make it from your heart inviting Christ to come in and be your Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for my sin. I pray that you'll forgive me and come into my heart and make me your child. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to live for you all the days of my life. I believe in you. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it, God heard that prayer, and I believe that God will and does forgive your sins. We'd like to help you get started growing in your walk and relationship with Jesus Christ. God bless you.
If you just prayed with Pastor John to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we are so excited for you. And we'd like to send you a Bible and some resources to get you started in your relationship with the Lord. Simply click on the contact link at the top of the page and tell us something like, I prayed to accept Christ. We'll get your Bible and resources mailed out to you right away. God bless you and welcome to the family of God.